Hey, welcome back to Metro Ball Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, this is Earth Scion, a data pack that just came out last week, and we just went through the runner cards. We had nine of those. So we have 11 here on the corp side that we're going to go through. Uh, yeah, let's dive in. Again, there are timestamps in the description, so if you want to just peruse at your own free will, do so. That's cool. Um, let's start here. This is Next Opal. So Next Opal is a code gate. It's nice. Uh, it's also an observer type and a next type, as all the next ice generally are. And Next Opal, yeah, three strength, four to res. It gains install one card from HQ paying all costs as a subroutine for each resed piece of next ice. And it is one influence. Cool, so this is something we kind of predicted going forward. Uh, we saw a card recently come out in the Red Sand Cycle, I'm pretty sure, which was this. It was Next Wave 2, and Next Wave 2 kind of showed that there was going to be a second wave of Next Ice, and we just saw it here, and so it's going to begin. Um, if you have, are not familiar with the Next Ice, the Next Ice started coming out cycles ago, um, and they're generally ice that gets stronger the more other resed copies of Next Ice you have on the table. So you have things like Next Bronze, Next Silver, you also have Next Gold, and Mother Goddess technically can be a next piece of ice. So now we have Next Opal. Interestingly enough, with the flavor, Opal actually, or Opals do actually exist on Mars, and I think that's really fantastic. Opals were discovered on Mars somewhat recently, this is back to 2015, and the discovery of Opals on Mars actually is a pretty big deal, just because Opals do, um, they're generally generated in uh, hot springs, um, and that sort of kind of wet, hot environment is very, um, it, it encourages microbial life. So the existence of opals on Mars might actually uh, provide a lot of evidence of the existence of life on Mars, at least at some point in time. So it's really cool that opals are coming up here, too. Um, so this is Opal, uh, and it is a really weird piece of next ice. Install one card from HQ, paying all costs is a pretty interesting ability. Um, yeah, it's also not fantastic because it's missing one word. Uh, this should probably say, and I think a lot of people would assume this would have said, install one, you, the corp, excuse me, may install one card from HQ paying all costs, but it doesn't say that. Uh, this card actually forces you to install cards when the runner hits this. And mind you, this could easily have four or five subroutines on it because of the more next ice you have. The idea is if you're playing a next package of silvers and, and bronzes, and now you res the next opal and the runner hits this, they can decide not to break it, and you are now forced to install your entire HQ. Yikes. We've seen this sort of issue before with, I don't want to call this templating, but we've seen a card before called Watchtower, which looked like to be a really promising idea for a Kogate in Wayland, but the fact that this doesn't say May, a lot of times the runner would let this fire just so you would shuffle R&D, so that if the runner's running with a medium or just getting access off the top, shuffling the deck is really good, because it changes the cards that they'll see. Um, and this is kind of the same idea, but arguably worse. That day again, if the runner hits this, you have five cards in hand, two of them are agendas, you're going to have to install all your agendas. Um, yeah, and that's not a, that's not good. If you have ice and you can't afford to install them, you're going to have to install them into naked new remote servers. That's not great either. Um, and this card can just be brutal and game losing if the runner hits this and decides not to break in the late game, which is such an issue. Um, interestingly enough, this card also brings up like some really weird, uh, like, elements in competitive play where you have to just trust the corp which is something that you need to avoid in competitive tables the idea that the, say the runner hits this and has five subroutines and the corp says oh i don't have anything to install i'm only holding on to operations there's no way to to like to prove that and i guess you have to call over a judge and make sure that they're telling the truth and that's kind of an issue um i don't like that at all um so all in all this card is kind of lousy I think because it is just game losing if in the wrong circumstances. Early game it is cool, I guess. Yeah, it is really expensive at four. It's also a three strength code gate, so Yog.0, which might be actually popular right now because of the existence of dedicated processor, which came out early in this data pack. Like this might just not be very fantastic. That being said, abstractly, the existence of Next Ice is a really big deal. The idea that suddenly, now if you're playing Next Bronze and Next Silver, you have three more copies of Ice that can make these things much stronger, especially Next Silver, which gets super obnoxious, um, does make these very good. Uh, right now, also, for the next four months, all these cards are going to be in rotation at the same time, so like the strength of Next Ice is going to go up and down while rotation hits, because eventually you're going to lose half of these. Um, but even with the ability of having like a next silver with eight or nine or ten 
subroutines on it. The fact that if you hit next opal in the mid to late game and choose not to fire, it can be game losing. Yeah, you can build your next deck around it and build a lot of assets so that you can just spam assets when the runner hits this, but it's really, really disastrous, and I wish this card had May on it, because it would be pretty good if it did. Arguably too good. I don't like Next Ice. A lot of times the counter to Next Ice is Ice Destruction. There's not a lot of better ways to deal with it, and that's kind of rough. However, we have another HP card in this pack that is absurdly good. It is on the opposite spectrum. It's so good. This is Byroid Work Crew. It's 2 to res, 4 to trash, so already res cost, trash cost, already in the favor of the corp. It's a Byroid Asset, um, which actually is a subtype we haven't seen on enough assets to date. And why that is, is because you can res them for free with Architects of Tomorrow. That's good. Get some value out of that ability. And this one says you can install, you have to trash Byroid Work Crew to install one card, paying all costs. And you can use this ability only immediately after playing an Operation. Um, so the idea is you play an Operation, you res this, you trash this, and you get install a card. Odd face value, that doesn't seem that good, right? Because you spend a click installing this, and you're just basically trading that click later. But being able to install a card for free a turn later is a really big deal considering how good HB is at fast advancing. Um, let's go through all the options here. So, uh, let's go through the range of things of why this card's so good. This is Subliminal Messaging. It's a very tenacious card. It's very easy to play the same copy of this card over and over in a game if the runner isn't running. But the idea is, when you play this, not only do you gain a credit, but you actually gain a click back. So it's like playing an operation that doesn't cost a click. So you play this, you still have three clicks left. Which means, if you have a Byroid Work Crew on the table, you can play Subliminal Messaging, use your Byroid Work Crew, and now you just install the 3-2 Agenda. You can now just fast advance out something like Accelerated Beta Test. Um, that's really easy to do. It's also incredibly cheap to do, considering, yeah, you do pay two for this, but you pay, got one back for, the accelerated beta, for installing the Accelerated Beta Test if you're playing Engineering the Future. You got one back from your Subliminal. You just fast advance out for three credits. Not too bad at all. Um, if you want to play a biotic labor instead of an accelerate of a, sorry, subliminal messaging, um, now you play a biotic, you have four clicks, you just installed an agenda, and now you can advance a card four times, which means you can install an advance of four two from hand with a biotic labor and one of these work crews. That's also really good. You can now fast advance out things like your successful field test, a card which is even so, so, so good in a deck that wants to be spamming out assets, which I imagine one that plays this might just want to do. One of the best ways you can defend one of these assets is by playing a lot more of them just because the runner can't afford to trash all these things. And we're not done yet on what this card can do, but that's one of the things about this card that I think makes it absurdly good. It's four to trash, which is a lot, and the runner has to trash it, because this card represents a win condition, one of the easiest win conditions. The runner plays a Biotic, they can score a 4-2. If the runner plays a Subliminal, they can score a 3-2. We'll get to the way you can score a 5-3 with this, but not only is this four to trash, it's two to res. And you don't need to res this card until you use it, so you're never going to sink two credits into this thing and get no value from it, which is absolutely brutal. Uh, the idea that you're, you're never going to spend the two credits, like if this card had to be res, so, oh, I pay two, now that I'm going to go trash it as a runner, it would make it, you know, a bit better for the runner, but you always have to pay four while the runner invests, or the corp, sorry, invests nothing in it. And that's absurd. Um, now, you can score a 5-3 with this. How you do that, you basically you play a biotic labor, and then on the table you have to have uh, Jeeves, Model Byroids, another card that's way more expensive to trash than it is to res. So now when you play a Biotic Labor, you install your 5-3 agenda, you advance it three times, get another click, advance it two more times with Jeeves, and you just fast advance a 5-3 agenda from hand. And that's really good. That's such an easy win condition. It is a couple cards, mind you, but we're talking about HB, a deck that can recur cards near endlessly with things like Team Sponsorship, another very expensive must-trash asset, and things like Friends in High Places. Even just things like archive memories is probably good enough, but like things will come back and they're not cheap to trash. Um, admittedly, this thing only fires once, but because it is an immediate use ability, it fires like you can't stop it with things like political operative. It's also not that expensive, so it gets around councilmen. Like if you plan to use it, just res it on the runner's turn. If they councilmen it, just res it on your turn after. Um, and that's an issue. This card is absurdly good. Um, interestingly, this card did get an immediate UFAC errata and is actually expecting an errata. I'm not sure whether this card, excuse me, whether this card is unplayable, whether it's broken, or whether this just is a clarification. But somebody asked, what does immediately after playing an operation on Byright Work Crew mean? Does that mean it triggers during the next paid ability window, or does it have some sort of special proprietary timing? And Michael Boggs answered that this card will be errata to say use this ability only during the next paid ability window 
window after playing and resolving an operation, and this will be updated in the next FAQ, which we don't know when that's going to come out, but we hope it comes out soon because of cards like Adjust the Matrix. Um, so what does that mean? It means a couple things. It means that uh, that you can actually play this card with a lot of other things, and I guess, yeah, this is clarified right underneath it, and this is a very important thing. Does Byroid Work Crew need to be res when the Corp plays an operation, or can they res and use in the same window? It does not need to be res when you play the operation. Also, you can use any other amount of paid ability window effects before using your Byroid Work Crew, which means you can make this, like, long convoluted stack of, like, triggers in which you're, like, uh, you ins play an operation which installs a card, which now you res your Bioroid work crew, which fires another thing to install a card. Like, you can get some weird timing off of this. It's also important to understand that you can, excuse me, you can use this during the next paid ability window. So even if you play something like a terminal event, things like uh, our friends in high places here. I was going to say our friends in, friends in high places. Um, but if you play like a friends in high places, which is a terminal, it ends your action phase, but there's actually a paid ability window during your discard phase. So you can friends in high places, and as long as you have this res on the table, you can also now use this to install a card from HQ, which just makes friends in high places even more obnoxious. Um, it's a really, really good card. It is such a low investment for a card that's probably going to be recurred a lot with friends in high places, going to be recurred a lot with team sponsorship, and it represents a very clear win victory, a win condition. You just have to keep this on the table for one turn, generally. You might be able actually to cheat this out by bioticking twice in a turn and fast advancing with it alone. Um, also, if you have troubles like trying to make sure this will be safe on the table, you always play advanced assembly lines. And only install this at the end of the runner's turn when you uh, know it's safe. And now you have a Byroid work crew and now you can fast advance. But this card is really, really good. And with HP Asset Spam, proving that a lot of the times the best way to tax out the runner is through assets and not through having them break ice. This is a very, very, very scary addition to that deck. Dang, this card's good. This is Ag Infusion. Talking about like very nuanced, interesting cards, I'm super excited about this one. I'm actually not sure how you pronounce this, whether it's Ag Infusion or Again Fusion. That one sounded way not good. Um, talking about the name, actually, I'm not sure why this is called this. There's a couple theories I have. Um, AG is the, the, silment, or the symbols for the element silver. And I did some research into this, and actually silver being used in... Um, Producing food if that's what ag infusion is. Why am I assuming this is food? I'm assuming this is food I guess because of other cards associated with it, but um actually people have been doing this This is real science where people have been injecting nanoparticles silver nanoparticles and food just because silver inherently has anti Microbial anti germ anti mold anti fungus properties So the idea is you can actually make food stay longer in worse conditions by injecting small amounts of silver in it Is that what ag infusion means like silver infusion? Um, more reason perhaps if not less creatively ag could just mean agro like agricultural infusion um, I'm convinced this is a food thing because of cards that came with it uh, but otherwise let's just talk about the ability is this is a division it's a Jinteki division it's 45 17 which is very very good on uh, it's on its own it has more influence to work with and it has a very nuanced ability it says once per turn instead of resing an approached piece of ice you may trash it to choose another server the runner is now running on that server and countering the outermost piece of ice, if any. This card was also spoiled earlier, and if you were at Worlds this year, you could play against um, FFG employees that were either playing this in Jemison. So some people had this card already, and it's a really exciting and interesting ability. Um, Firstly, it's important to understand how this card works because it calls into uh, attention all the, the proper timing windows about approaching, and resing, and uh, encountering ice. I actually heard from people who are at Worlds that some of the designers of FFG played this incorrectly. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to see this card and actually play it incorrectly. I think this card is going to be one of the most incorrectly played IDs uh, probably of all time. Uh, for casual players, maybe as soon as you play in a tournament scene, someone's probably going to correct you. So I think it's important to understand how this works. So once per turn, when the runner is approaching a piece of ice, you can trash a piece of ice to choose another server and put the runner there. 
you don't have to be able to res the piece of ice that's been approached. You don't have to have the six credits to the six credit piece of ice. You just have to be able to res the piece of ice. So if there's something like a DDoS on the table that you can't res the ice, or uh, that's largely it, right? I guess there's also false echo. You can't use this ability. But the idea is that if you can res the ice, doesn't matter if you can afford it, you now pick another server that runner's running on it. But not only is the runner running on it, the runner is encountering the outermost piece of ice on that server. And encountering is important, not approaching, because that means if you redirect the runner onto a server that has an unresed piece of ice, it's going to remain unresed because you can't res ice during the encounter phase. You can't. And that actually makes this ID a lot worse than it probably looks. I still think it's a fantastic ID, but a lot of people will see this as, hey, turn one, I'm going to have three unresed ice on uh, on all my remotes or my central servers. And if the runner runs, I'm going to trash whatever ice they run on and hopefully redirect them to a Komainu. And then the Komainu is going to do all their damage. But you can't do that because the Komainu has to be res because you can't res ice on an encounter. Be careful about that because I think a lot of people are going to goof that and that makes this ID a bit easier to play against as a runner because you can't, you can now run when no ice is rest and you can't, you don't have to be prepared for the worst. And that's a really big deal. All right, now we have that out of the way. What do we do with this ID? What do we do? This is a cool ID. This is a pure glacier idea i think it helps you score agendas it also works a bit with traps i'm not convinced it's that good with traps but it does really cool jinteki defense stuff i think the most similar idea we have to this is um abstractly at least is replicating perfection an id is uh, yeah it's rp generally a lot of people call it replicating perfection this idea won worlds a couple years ago. It's a very strong idea. The idea with replicating perfection is if you want to run on a remote server, you have to waste a click or spend a click, you could say, running a central server before tackling the remote. And this makes the turn very taxing because not only do you have to spend a click, an extra click, you have to encounter or approach and encounter a piece of ice on a central server. And generally those are expensive to deal with and you can't let them fire. Um, and this ability is very similar. Admittedly, uh, Jinteki Replicating Perfection is going to rotate out in a couple months, in about three, four months, something like that. So this is very similar because the idea is if I want to run a remote server and a remote server has an unrest piece of ice on it, you can trash the unrest piece of ice and now I have to run a central server or any other server and I generally have to deal with one piece of ice before I can jack out and then run the remote again. So in some ways it is definitely similar, but it's also very different. This deck is going to have some very interesting construction because it wants generally a lot of piece of ice, a lot of pieces of ice. It also wants to have a lot of ice installed. It wants to have unresed ice and it wants to be able to recur ice because you're going to have to trash your side of the board to uh, to do cool stuff. This is also very interesting, similar to Jemison, which I think is a fantastic design, how you have to like destroy some of your board state just to get advantage. And this generally produces some very interesting uh, moments on when playing Netrunner. Here, I, have a, I got its own dedicated window of things you want to do with this. Can we get to it? Are we here? No, we're not. Where, where are you at? There we are. Okay, cool. So let's talk about things you can do with this ID. Firstly, if you have a resed big piece of ice and it's on the outside of any remote, whether you just want to leave that on archives, whether you want to make a, a dedicated remote server for this and you have it resed, which might be difficult if you do it on a dedicated remote server, now, anytime the runner hits an unrest piece of ice, you can trash it to force the runner to run on your big, big, big ice. So if you have a Chiashi rezzed, bless you, uh, ble bless your soul, I suppose. Um, now the runner has to deal with this. At all point in time when they're running on an unrest piece of ice, they have to be, they have to think, okay, wait, shit. I'm going to have to res run through a Chiashi because they can trash the ice and redirect you here. That's absurd. That's very, 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 very good because this card is not only a fun punishing face check, it's also arguably harder to break. So they have to say, okay, if I'm going to make a run on a remote or on a central server, I, there's an unrest piece of ice, which means I'm going to be running that Chiashi. Again, like we said, you have to have that, get that Chiashi rezzed earlier, and it has to be on the outside ice of that server, which might be difficult, but at the end of the day, that's a really, really, really strong effect. Also, the ability that you can change where a runner is running is super good when it comes to central servers or, excuse me, targeted server runs. Cards like Account Siphon that said make a run on HQ. If you have an unrezzed ice on HQ, you can now just trash that unrezzed piece of ice and redirect the Account Siphon to a different server. It doesn't matter which server. Now, even if that run is successful, that run is not successful on HQ, so Account Siphon doesn't work. It's the same for all other uh, powerful runs that require a certain server that say, like, make a run on a certain server. Things like indexing, maker's eye, stuff like that. 
Um, this has actually been ruled in FAQs and uh, I think, yeah, it's officially been ruled that if you do play an account siphon and it is moved to the, another server, it doesn't matter if that run is successful or not because you didn't make a successful run on HQ, it fizzles. So you actually have an ability that can almost 100% stop big runs as long as you have unresed ice on that server which makes this very interesting because you have to understand when am i going to res that ice when am i going to not res that ice when i'm going to use my ag infusion ability ag infusion ability is that once per turn it's once per turn too so like there's going to be some interesting counterplay around that so be mindful about that but this does give some inherent very strong defense to super strong runs now, if you're trashing your cards, you're going to have to bring them back, right? Um, also, you might be interested in derezzing some of your cards because you might get value of having a card derezzed more than you have value of it being rezzed because it actually gets more taxing because now this derezzed card represents running on a Chiyashi as opposed to it being the pup that you put in your deck. This is replanting, and this is actually one of the big reasons why I think Ag Infusion is an agricultural thing. Um, this is a double. It came out a pack or two ago. I think one pack ago it's a double and it lets you add one of your installed cards to hq and then install two cards not only does it let you install two cards but it ignores all costs so you can actually build some pretty deep servers without paying a premium add one card of your installed cards from two hq is a really big deal because it lets you reposition things but it also lets you take a res card and lets you reinstall it on res which again might be better value this card is huge in ag infusion and i think it's going to really 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 shine you also have cards like Friends in High Places, which is huge, it's one influence, it lets you install two cards from archives, so you can always install two face down cards, put them on remotes, and your, your central servers, and you're good to go. This card is going to be maybe a three of in most Ag Infusion decks. You also do have Interns. Uh, Interns is a much slower and has been largely outclassed by Friends in High Places, but this one doesn't ignore install costs, which can be good in some times, but I don't think it's necessary with both Replanting and Friends, so that's cool. There's also a bunch of ice that's really good in Ag Infusion for a bunch of reasons. Crick, very strong. If you have this on Archives, it fires. It's a 6 strength code gate, hard to break. No matter what, if this fires, you get an ice back, which is a big deal because you can put now face down ice back, and that's one of the best things you can do. You can also pay the 3 influence for Architect, which is a pretty solid card, um, especially because it can't be trashed. Um, but it's solid, and you have 17 influence, mind you, so you can start making some pretty ridiculous calls on what you put in your deck, and this one might be good. This card actually might be a 3 of in the deck, because it's incredibly, incredibly good. If the runner can't deal with Excalibur, which is inherently hard to deal with, considering it is a, a typeless mythic ice, so it can't be break, broken by conventional breakers, you can always like trash one of your installed cards, uh, your unrezzed ice, and force the runner to run on Excalibur. And if they run on Excalibur, that's it. They're not running anymore this turn, and that might be the easiest way to score an agenda. This card is super, super, super valuable. You also could play Mother Goddess. Um, Mother Goddess might be typeless if all you have is a Mother Goddess on a remote, and then you're just having unrezzed ice. Not convinced that's good, but it's a thing. We also did get Bloom earlier in this, uh, this cycle. I'm not convinced this is so good, but it lets you install cards from HQ. Some of them might be unrezzed. In fact, all of them that you install are unrezzed, and that could have value. This card comes out of nowhere and starts being really good. Port Anson Grid is a region. It has a really high trash cost, not a big res cost. And it says if the runner wants to jack out while running on the server, they have to trash an installed program. Which means if you have Port Anson Grid on any remote, on any central server, and you redirect the runner to that server and say that server has two or three pieces of ice, the runner's not going to have to break all those pieces of ice if they don't want to jack out. Uh, because if they jack out, they have to trash a program. Admittedly, this gets worse if that server has end the run subroutines because the runner will just end the run. But the idea is if you have a Chiyashi, yeah, if you have a Chiyashi, the second most piece of ice, and the first piece of ice is like a Komainu, the runner wants to break the Komainu, probably doesn't want to take four damage. Do they jack out? Do they take four damage and end the run? It's very hard, and this card actually gets really, really good. Labyrinthine server is also kind of difficult to use, but it prevents a runner from jacking out, so if you redirect them onto a taxing server, they have to deal with all of it. Ramen Rai actually is kind of cool. Might get value because if you're playing a lot of ice in this deck, and you might want to play like 20, 22 pieces of ice in this deck, uh, you can now basically spend a click to change the ice you drew with an ice in archives, which might be what you're looking for right now. This card gets good if your deck is running a lot of the same type of, of card. So if you're running 22 pieces of ice, this card is okay. Not sure. I haven't really seen this thing work. Georgia Emelioff, also really good. If the runner's not going to make a successful run on the server you redirected them to, and you can also move this around, mind you, if you have the money, you can start throwing out net damage left, right. Inazuma is dirty because Inazuma can fire, and then if the next piece of ice is unrezzed, you can now move them to a new server, and Inazuma will still work because it's the first piece of ice they encountered after it. You also have Midori. 
Midori could be really strong in this deck. I love that this, like, this is the coolest thing about the design of the Ag Infusion, is that so many cards just show up from the binders and are really good suddenly, and that's always exciting for Netrunner. I love cards that expand the design space and the play space. Midori lets you switch a, an ice being approached with an ice from HQ, which means the ice from HQ will be unrest. You don't lose the ice in you don't lose the ice that you had. You will lose the cost of it. Like if it is a res piece of ice, you'll trade it for an unres piece of ice. But sometimes that's all you need um, to suddenly throw the runner onto archives into your Excalibur or what have you. You also have Hamitsu Baku, which is cute because you can easily bring this back to reinstall it. And you also have an offer you can't refuse, which is a very interesting card. Um, a lot of people might see Ag Infusion and think like, okay, I'm going to bounce a runner. And I'm going to make them run on a server that has my Project June bug, which is a trap that has a bunch of advancements on it. Um, but the, unfortunately, the runner can just jack out. Like, there's no clause on this thing that says a runner can't jack out. So if you redirect them onto a Project June bug server, they can just say, okay, I'm not accessing it. And that does nothing. This is Project June bug. It's from the core set, mind you. The idea with the offer you can't refuse, you can pay four credits. And now you can force the runner to interact with your remote servers, which is a thing that this card couldn't do before, because this just said central servers. So now you can say offer you can't refuse, trash an installed piece of ice, make the runner run on a remote server that has a June bug on it, and they either access it or you get one agenda point. I think a lot of times the runner will just let you have one agenda point when you pay four credits and a click for it, which is honestly not too bad. It seems expensive, but it's one click as opposed to three clicks or generally four clicks and three credits to install a 3-1. Talking about 3-1 agendas, you do have ancestral, ancestral imagery or imager, which technically discourages jacking out, which might be good, but I'm not convinced this card is that good as it is. 3-1s are generally hard to win with. It's also just like Jinteki, right? So you can play things like uh, Caprice Nisse and Marcus Batty and just run like good defensive upgrades. This is such a cool ability and it's very, very, very strong. It's going to protect your servers. It requires intelligent play. It requires intelligent deck building. You're going to run a lot of ice. Um, actually, maybe Mine Layer is worth playing. Maybe it is. Yeah, maybe it is. I'm not sure. Um, it's totally an interesting ability. Unfortunately, this ability, which, you know, and that's one of the things that I really, oh, I hate this card, is that if ever you have an ability on a piece of, uh, on an identity that changes how you deck construct and basically changes how you play the game and not like a very standard way and like a very bizarre way, um, it gets absolutely ruined by Employee Strike. Because as soon as the runner plays Employee Strike, if your plan was to trash on res dice to make them run on excalibur or like do interesting tricks with your chiashis and all that you can't do it anymore and it just kind of turns off everything you tried to do um so for that reason you might want to either play ways to fast advance out to turn off the current or maybe you just want to play your own currents in ag infusion because employee strike is going to make you look dumb um and i really don't like that card so much because it makes the fun stuff not work anymore this is Ag Confusion, absolutely brilliant uh, identity, I'm super excited to play it. There's a lot of things I'm probably not mentioning in this because there's a lot of weird things you can do with this. Please let me know in the comments what you're excited about. But 45, mind you, 17 makes this so interesting. The, the, the design space on this card is it just it's absurd. It's, it's really, really, really high and it's going to have a lot of very interesting play. The, the biggest thing you're going to have to try in battle is be able to reinstall your cards often because trashing cards is a pretty rough cost. Installing cards also is a waste of tempo and generally credits. So I think you're going to have to stack your deck with a bunch of architects and interns, maybe not architects, but friends in high places and mostly replanting uh, to build something meaningful. But I think this is still going to be a very viable option. We have Bamboo Dome. It is a Jinteki upgrade. It's also a region. Uh, it costs one to res, only two to trash though. Uh, and this one says specifically you can only install on the root of R&D. And we've only started to see, uh, or we've only seen what, two upgrades like this that are locked to certain remotes. And this one says, click, you can reveal the top three cards of R&D. Secretly choose one to add to HQ and return the other to the top of R&D in any order. And it's limit region, excuse me, one per server. Three influence too, so I suppose you could splash if you want. So you splash this down, you start, you strap it down on R and D. You res it for one credit, which is not nothing, but it's not a lot. And now you spend a click and you reveal the top three cards of R and D. Revealing cards is something that's actually really, really, really not good to do, because um, it shows the runner what you're going to draw. It's going to sh like it shows two things. Firstly, you got to say one of those cards you're drawing. The second card is going to be on top of the R and D, and the third card is going to be on R and D a click below. Um, 
which is a lot of information. Now, a lot of people see this when they see cards like this in Celebrity Gift, and they say like, oh, well, you're giving information to the runner, sure, but if you're playing like a trap deck where you're running a lot of snares, you're running a lot of shocks and fetal AIs and stuff like that, what does it matter? Like, the runner's not going to run anyways, um, so like, Yomi and all that. And I don't agree with that. I actually love it when a trapped Jinteki player plays Celebrity Gift because it shows me what they have in hand. And if they have two snares in hand, I can now know to run R&D. If they didn't show me two snares in their hand, I would have ran HQ and I would have hit the snares. Like it seems super counterproductive and this kind of feels the same way where if you're going to show traps, I'm going to know where they are. Admittedly, this gives a little bit more confusion where you don't know where the snares in HQ or in R&D. But as soon as you use the Bamboo Dome the second time, and that's the thing with Bamboo Doom, as soon as you use it the second time in the same turn, you're only going to see one more card. Right? So now the question is, do you draw that card or did you draw a card previously? And it's it's technically clicking for drawing, but it's slightly better than drawing. Um, also, like, it's a way to draw while also keeping the top card of R&D not an agenda, which is definitely interesting. Um, because you can return the other in any order. For that reason, it is kind of cool, so maybe you need to trash this. But um, it's not like a very strong draw card. Otherwise, like it's not going to draw you a lot of cards. Uh, but like giving information to the runner, where if you use Bamboo Dome and then you use Bamboo Dome again, they know 100% what you drew, so now they know what's an HQ, might not be the best thing to do. But yeah, returning the order to the top of the cards is actually a really big deal because of things like making sure there's no agendas on the top of R&D, but also because of one special card, Mutate. Oh man, Mutate is like really, really playable with Bamboo Dome. And the idea of Mutate is you can trash one of your installed cards, one of your installed ice, sorry, and now play the top ice off the top of R&D for free and replace them. So the idea is if you want to play an Ag Infusion, you want to play Chiashi, but you're not going to have the economy to res this, uh, all you do is you play your Bamboo Dome, and you can play Bamboo Dome in anything. It doesn't have to be Ag Infusion, right? You play Bamboo Dome, uh, you see that and you put a Chiashi on the top of your deck and now you just mutate freely and it's always going to fire and that's really, really, really good. Mutate represents a lot of value if you can build your deck around it and I'm really excited to see this thing see play. Um, yeah, that's cool. Also, you trash an ice so now it's an archive so now you can friends in high places back to get a face down and that's just great. That's kind of cool. You also have other cards like Hasty Relocation which sort of work with this thing, not very well, but better off you actually can build decks that play Accelerated Diagnostics. Uh, this card has always been really interesting in Netrunner, but the idea is if you play Bamboo Dome and you see, oh, there's two operations on the top, you might want Accelerated Diagnostics just for value. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe you can build some like somewhat degenerate combo decks with this. This card's only one influence, mind you, but that's actually kind of cool. Um, yeah, it's a weird card. A lot of parts of it don't strike me to be that good, but being able to protect the top of R&D is kind of interesting. You're going to be drawing, but you're not going to be like shuffling and seeing new cards, so it's kind of like drawing for a card. I think I might be underselling this, just because protecting the top of R&D is pretty good. It is really easy to trash, though. If the runner finds this when they're running R&D or HQ, they will trash it for two credits and see another card if they run again, and that's kind of an issue. Um, so that's not fantastic. But all in all, it's definitely an interesting card, uh, that's for sure. Um, and we'll see what we can build with it. The more cards that like go off the top of R&D, the better. Uh, that make this very interesting. But again, just be careful. Revealing the top three cards of your deck, generally not a great thing. I think especially in a trap deck. And people argue the Yomi option, but I'm not really sold. Wow, we've seen this card coming for a while, and we finally have it. This is Ben Musashi. Uh, it's a unique clone, which is something that I've always found to be a bit... Um, yeah, it's oxymoronic, no? It's an upgrade. One to res, three to trash, and says each time the runner accesses an agenda from the server, he or she must suffer two net damage as an additional cost in order to steal it. This also applies even during a run on which the runner trashes Ben Musashi. Two influence means it's splashable, and the theming on this card is absolutely brilliant. So, Miyamoto Musashi is a famous um, expert Japanese swordsman and ronin. Uh, the coolest thing about this is that the, the Musashi was renowned for having a double blade swordsmanship style. He, he fought with two blades. Unfortunately, you don't see it on the art here, but the fact that two blades versus two net damage is so perfect. Really well done there, FFG. On top of that, he wrote a book of swordsmanship called the Book of Five Rings, which might be a familiar term to you if you're familiar with the Legend of Five Rings, a card that uh, FFG is... Uh, a card game FFG is rebooting relatively soon. I think it starts at Gen Con in a couple of months. But like this is Miyamoto Masashi, the guy behind, that's what he looks like in classic Japanese art, but the dude behind Legend of Five Rings and just the double swordsman thing. Just absolutely charming. Well done, FFG. So what does this card do? It protects agendas. Uh, it's Even if you trash it, it protects agendas. We've seen this before. I think only two other factions have cards like this. We have... Um, 
shit what's it called we have red herrings which is um attack on economy and we also have um a strong box which is an attack on clicks which is kind of thematic based off of what those factions do haven't seen a wayland one yet shame um but this has been musashi uh interesting thing about this and this is very important it says if the runner wants to steal the agenda, they have to suffer two net, net damage, which makes it the cost of stealing the agenda. So if you want to play your anti genteki tech and run things like feedback filter, which prevent net damage, this doesn't work. Because you actually have to suffer the net damage to take the agenda off Ben Musashi. If you're going to pay credits to avoid the net damage, it's not going to work. So you can't prevent this damage, which makes it very, very, very strong. Now the cool thing about this is that it actually doesn't do anything if you don't steal the agenda. So if you run into the server and you find the agenda and think, well, oh, taking two net damage is going to be an issue, you don't have to steal it. And so in theory, it doesn't do anything besides protect the agendas. However, this works really well with certain agendas, especially agendas that have really strong on-axis effects. It's largely just one. This is Fetal AI, and Fetal AI on Ben Musashi is absolutely disgusting. Fetal AI says when you access it, take two net damage. So if you run this, you access the fetal AI, you take two net damage. If you steal with Ben Musashi, you take two net damage. If you play the core Jinteki identity, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, not potential unleashed. That one's good too. But you play um, shit, personal evolution. You take another one de de net damage for stealing it. So you take five net damage for stealing a fetal AI. AI. If you don't steal a fetal AI because Ben Musashi is a problem, you still take two net damage because you access it. It's absolutely gross. Uh, sorry, this is personal evolution course at um it's really really good and it's technically unpreventable damage right if you're going to steal an agenda you're going to take the damage so no matter what it's going to be doing damage because you can't prevent it and that's really really strong that's really really strong in decks that want to grind you out it's really really strong in decks that want to burst kill you things like uh potential unleashed that want to do unblockable damage this card is great because the idea is do you steal that house of knives or do you take two net damage um they're not separate instances so you only mill one card at the top of your deck but it's still good low res cost higher trash cost make this card very 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 playable it's good it's really good now there are a lot of hate cards against this it is a jinteki unique upgrade which means if you just play rumor mill it flattens a lot of jinteki decks um that's actually one of the things that I'm really excited about Ag Infusion. Like, I think you can actually score Glaciary without suffering by losing Rumor Mill and not being able to play Caprice. Um, but Rumor Mill crushes this. I think even worse right now is that we have Film Critic. And Film Critic not only uh, protects you from taking damage from personal evolution because you're not stealing agendas, but it actually, you just like swipe the agenda onto Film Critic and you're not stealing it. So Ben Musashi does nothing. Film Critic is actually really popular in the meta right now because of things like Hunter Seekers. So Ben Musashi might be released at a really bad time just based on the cards that have been released around him. Uh, but otherwise, it seems very solid. Uh, we also have, this is the slightest spoilers, avert your eyes if you don't want to see it, but this has been officially spoiled by FFG, but there is a 5-3 agenda coming out very soon that does a lot of net damage, and in theory you can make a server that's almost impossible to steal with Ben Musashi, and that's awesome. Um... That's really, really good. Same with this one. Additional cost, they must suffer the net damage, so you can't prevent it, which is pretty gross. It's really gross. How do you deal with Film Critic? Uh, in Faction, you have things like uh, Voter Intimidation. You might want to be doing that uh, just to Voter Intimidate your Film Critic because um, that's good, and that helps because Film Critic really throws a, a, a wrench into Ben Musashi's plans. Theming on this card is fantastic. Um, all in all, it's 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 definitely solid. It's it's a, a card that you can also excuse me, you can also combo this with other like net damage or damage upgrades. Things like Hokusai Grid are really good. And now the question is, is this a Ben Musashi? Is this a Hokusai Grid? That's really good because now all three do three net damage on top of things. You can also play Prysec and build like some absurd upgrade. Oh, is that one word? Yeah, you can build some absurd upgrade kill deck. It's there's a lot of uh, options here it's a lot of options putting this on a central server is also maybe fine uh especially if you know what the top card of r d is with your bamboo dome i guess definitely a very solid card and we'll probably see this for a while to come uh film critic hurts it but again this is just more net damage and a lot of times all jitechi decks need to do is just a bit more net damage to be able to win and that's very very solid back to card game db we have an authenticator this is an NBN code gate. It's two to res, four strength. That's a nuts ratio. It has two subroutines on it. The corp gains two credits and end the run. Those are really good. But it says when the runner encounters Authenticator, he or she may take a tag to bypass it. It's also only one influence. I really like this card. I think it's really, really, really good. Um, 
it's really good. We've seen a lot of good cards in this pack, mind you. So on its own, like say you're trying to break this by conventional means. It's four strength two subroutines, which means that the Gordian Blade tax, uh, Gordian Blade breaks this thing for four credits. Admittedly, you don't need to break all of it. Like you could, in theory, break it for three credits and let the corp gain two credits, but that's not a good exchange because now it's a five credit swing as opposed to if you just broke all four, it's only a four credit swing. Not always the right thing to do, but generally that's better. And the reason why this card is like so nutsly overstated, because this is two to res, mind you. Also, that's fantastic because the runner runs this early game and doesn't want to take the tag. You res this for two and you gain two back. So it's basically a four cost or four strength, double that subroutine, zero cost code gate and the run. And that's kind of absurd if this fires in the early game. Now, this is inherently balanced by when the runner encounters Authenticator. They may take a tag to bypass it, which means a couple things. Firstly, if the runner is playing tag me, this ice is never going to really matter that much because you're always just going to take a tag. That does matter if you care how many tags the runner has, if you're playing things like psychographics, or if you want the runner to have more than one tag because you want to hit them with things like a boom or cards that require more than one tag. Um, so that's something. But if your runner is playing tag me, this card does very little. Now, um, if the runner takes a tag, how much of a tax is that? Interestingly, also, this says the runner has to take a tag to bypass it. So cards like New Angel City Hall uh, that say avoid a tag, just like avoiding net damage or preventing net damage, you can't New Angel City Hall to get through it because technically you didn't take the tag, so technically you didn't pay the cost, so technically you're not bypassing it. So you actually have to properly take the tag. Admittedly, Aaron Moran is popular, so this card gets a bit worse if they Aaron Moran through it for free and draw a card, but that's honestly not terrible and you can target M Aaron Moran in the yellow if you want to by playing things like MCA informant so you can get rid of Aaron Moran nowadays if you really are dedicated to doing that how much is it like what kind of tax is that taking a tag generally represents regardless besides Aaron Moran two credits and a click which means this card costs about three and a half credits to get through, right? Because a click represents a credit generally. It often represents a bit more than a credit because you can generally make more than a credit. You're generally not clicking for credits in your decks. Hopefully your decks are better than that. Which means that this card costs you two, and if the runner wants to get through it, it's going to cost them around three credits. Around three credits. And that's cheaper than breaking it with... Uh, that's still cheaper than breaking it with means, which means you they might always do that which is honestly not that bad this card gets way better if you play it in sync because sync is a, an id that says tags are now three credits to remove which means that this card costs three credits and a click to get through which means it's sometimes better just to break it which means you have this ridiculously understated card that has an end the run code gate on it mind you i think there's only two end the run code gates in nbn and both of them the cheapest one is like five credits and the other one is toll booth which is eight credits so like Having a cheap end the run that's good in early game where the runner can't take the tempo hit of clearing three credits and a tag uh, when they're playing against sync is something that NBN sort of needed. It was like it was an empty spot in their design space. They didn't have end the run code gates. Admittedly, this will never strictly end the run, but it's definitely something. And this card's cool because it's very like while it might not be relevant to the runner's floating tags. Um, this is the interesting thing about NBN Ice. You have a lot of NBN Ice that is uh, that is good when the runner is floating tags, and you have a lot of NBN Ice that's useless when the runner's floating tags. Like, there's a mixture, and this card kind of fits into there. Like, we have a card like Resistor, and Resistor is kind of the polar opposite to this. Like, Resistor is a card that's not good if the runner's not floating tags, but as soon as the runner is heavily tagged, this card is very solid. So you have an issue. Like, if the runner is not playing tag me, your Resistors suck. And you have the opposite side of the field, we have Authenticators, where if the runner is not floating tags, uh, if the, this card's good, but if they are floating tags, this card's useless. So it kind of gives you a card slot where you can now build an NBN deck that is going to do all right no matter which way the runner goes. Like, you now have more options, where if the runner goes tag me, you have things that are annoying. If the runner doesn't go tag me, you have things that are annoying. And I think Authenticator's really cool for that reason. Also, the runner takes a tag during a run and enables a lot of other nonsense. Like, you have things like Data Ward that are really good. The idea is that you have a Data Ward and behind one of these authenticators, they can't take the tag because now they have to deal with this thing, which makes this card really, really good. Um, that's fantastic. You also have Keegan Lane. Or actually, wait, what's the wording on Keegan Lane? Do they have to use the program? No, it's just any program. So now with Keegan Lane and Authenticator, things get really gross. Where if they want to go through it, you maybe trash your program. And that's kind of scary when they're running through this on an unres card in a remote server. Maybe it's a Keegan Lane. 
I think this is really solid. It's not going to stop any like really meaningful runs. Like the runner can always take a tag with Aaron Moran around. Maybe taking a tag isn't so bad, but on its own, it's a really solid piece of ice for two credits. You can maybe even splash this in other factions. Maybe Argus Security wants this, where they really want to attack you with tags. Because at the end of the day, it's like a solid end of the run. Can't rush through it, but it it, it does definitely even up the, the sort of ice that NBN has, where again, if they go tag me or don't go tag me, you'll have something for them regardless. And I think that's really cool. We have a quote here from Henry Phillips, a new character we haven't seen before. I'm sure there's no way this could go wrong for you, which is pretty foreboding. And then we have Henry Phillips, who showed up immediately after. Henry Phillips is an NBN Syslop upgrade, unique, only one Henry Phillips. It's 2-2, two, two. so 2 to res, 2 to trash, 1 influence as well. And it says, whenever the runner breaks a cyber team during a run on the server, gain 2 credits if they are tagged. Alright, so obviously... Um, Actually, there's like a sort of a synergy with these two cards. Immediately, Henry Phillips and Authenticator are going to do nothing if the runner takes a tag because they're not breaking any subroutines. But you have Authenticator and behind it another piece of ice and the runner takes a tag. Now your Henry Phillips is going to get you money. Now, this is strictly an economy card. You could, theory, in theory, see it as a defensive card. Like, if you have this rezzed on a remote server or a central server where the runner has uh, an ice that's going to give out a tag. Uh, there's some ice that give out tags irregardless of breaking things. Like, Data Raven are really good with this. I think the other one is Thoth, if I'm not mistaken. So, the idea is if you have a Thoth or a Data Raven and an ice behind it, you will get some value with your Henry Phillips. Question is, how much value do you get with your Henry Phillips? And I don't think you get a lot. Um, how much money do you need from a card to uh, to get economy out of it? Like, how much economy sorry, do you need out of a card to put it in your deck? And this one reses for two credits. So the first subroutine that's broken, you break even. The second subroutine that's broken on this run, you gain two credits. And the third, four credits. So if the runner breaks three subroutines on a run, that you get this. The runner doesn't trash it, which is very usable trash. You put it in a server. The runner gets a tag. You have multiple pieces of ice set up in the right way. You get a sure gamble worth of money. Or a sweep tweak of money in some scenarios. There's just a lot of things that need to line up for this card to be good. Admittedly, it is a lot easier to set these things up kind of retroactively with friends in high places where you can just throw this thing up and then later rebuild it in like a better situation, and that's kind of cool. But overall, if you're having this card as a card way to make money, I think there are just easier and better ways to make money in Netrunner that don't rely on multi card combos. So what is this card for? Is it a defensive card? The idea that if this is seen res on a server, you might not want to run it just because you're going to give the corp some money. And I don't think it gives the corp that much money, but it'll never keep a runner out of a server. Like, you can still account siphon through HQ. This card is particularly the best that a runner is floating tags. Like, if you hit the runner with a mid-season replacement, so you can put this on any server, right? But then you have an issue with, um, with this card inherently, where if the runner is tag me, and all your or a lot of your subroutines on your ice say things like trace three, give the runner a tag or like gain two credits or stuff like that. The runner's probably not breaking a lot of your subroutines, right? Like if you're burying the runner with tags and then you play your resistor, your resistor is like strength 14 or what have you. So the runner's not going to break resistor. They're just going to fire the trace, which makes your Henry Phillips a lot worse. Like it's a really interesting situation. Because I think a lot of the times when the runner is tagged, they're not breaking that many subroutines. Or when they're playing tag me, they're not breaking that many subroutines. All in all, I think it's very hard to get a lot of value with this card. Like, to get the amount of money that you probably need to include as a deck slot, I think that's actually pretty difficult. Um, just, just a lot of pieces that need to come together for this thing to work. Uh, there are some, like, really okay best-case scenarios. Again, if you have a tag in front of a data ward, you'll get, like, technically six credits off of this. Yeah, and that's kind of cute. Um, but I think if you just want to like attack the runner, well, that's more accurately. I think you want to attack the runner. Like if you want to play a positional card that requires runs and tags, I'd rather play Keegan Lane uh, just to trash a program, which might actually be a better tempo hit for you. It's also cheaper to use and harder to trash. And I think that's a lot better. I think this card's pretty underwhelming. It is one influence though. So like in theory, if you're playing a tag me Wayland, and I think Wayland deals with this the best because they have the most multi subroutine ice. Um, that you might have to get through. Like, you're going to break three subroutines on Spiderweb if you're going to get through regardless, as opposed to, like, things with traces on them. So maybe you get some value out of that. But again, if you're playing Wayland, I think there's better ways to make money. And talking about Wayland and talking about Spiderweb, oh my god, this is Battlement. Uh, it's a three-strength, or three-cost barrier. It's only two-strength. and has two end-the-run subroutines. They both say end-the-run. Yeah, that was redundant. Um, but that's what this card is. It's redundant. This card upsets me. Uh, it really does. It really does upset me for a couple reasons. It's very boring. Um, 
it's incredibly boring, and that's kind of been an issue that we've been seeing with Wayland, is that if there's a really, really just boring generic card, Wayland gets it. And they're generally not good cards. <laughs> they're not like cards that are in any way pushing the envelope. They're just kind of like, oh, we put end the runs on something. Yeah, have fun with that, Wayland. And that's an issue, because I like playing a lot of Wayland, and a lot of the card pool has not been that great. So this is Battlement. It's one credit, one and one subroutine less than Spiderweb, which is something that already exists. Admittedly, this will cycle out at some point in the near future. Actually, no, this one will be around for a while, right? Yeah, for a while longer. And it's also in between Wall and Static, which traded one of the strength for one subroutine. So Spiderweb is interesting because Spiderweb actually specializes in something. It specializes in having a lot of subroutines, which is good because it actually taxes out a lot of icebreakers better than anything else. This was a popular card when Faust was being played just because Faust had to pay a card per subroutine. So this thing was a three card tax and for that reason Spiderweb was good. It was also good when people were playing Lady at some point in time because Lady now had to use two tokens to get through three subroutines, which was good. This card specializes in doing something and for that reason it's actually all right. This is Wall of Static, which is in the core set, and it costs nobody influence. It generally costs about 2 credits to break this thing with almost every breaker in the game. This card is... And there's only one breaker in the entire game that sees play that breaks this for more credits than Wall of Static. Out of all the conventional fractors, there's one fractor that breaks Battlement for more money than Wall of Static, and that's Breach, which isn't a very common fractor and only works on central servers anyway, so I don't get it. Oh, apparently if you yell, it doesn't work. Um, and that's Breach. So why does this exist? Sorry, that's what Breach looks like, right? Breach actually breaks this for uh, Wall of Static for four, while it only breaks this thing for two. So why do they print this? And I honestly don't know. Like, this card could not exist in Netrunner. This card could be a neutral card also for what it's worth. It's kind of interesting because it's sort of thematic with the line of the spiderweb or everything like that. But it's just inherently worse than Wall Aesthetic, if not equal to Wall Aesthetic, which is a neutral card that has the same effect. Yeah, Battlement is slightly better for cards that say whenever you break a subroutine, do something. But those are very niche. And if we want to play about that or care about that, things like Chief Slee, mind you, stuff like that, we would just go ahead and play um, Spiderweb because it has more subroutines on it, right? I don't get it. I hate this. And we've seen this so many times. It's like so disheartening where you had, oh, there was like a really cool data pack where we got all these, uh, the, the founder, the pioneer ice, where every, every um, faction got this ice that's super good on one server. So HP got Turing, a card that was a really big deal for a very long time. Uh, Jintegi got Crick, which is a card that was a six strength, one cost code gate, which is a very big deal because it made replicating perfection a lot better. Uh, we got Gutenberg, which I don't know how to spell, so I'm going to wing it, um, which was just Trace 7 on a 6-strength Sentry. That's fantastic. And then, of course, Wayland got a barrier that ends the run that's slightly under-costed. Like, this keeps happening, and I don't get it. And the runs are not good in Netrunner. That's not how you tax out the runner. They're going to need a certain amount to res this. When they run and hit this thing, you just res it, and nothing happens to them. Like, they don't lose anything. It doesn't win any tempo. It's just, like, the worst thing. And we're seeing it on the most boring card possible. I hate this. And the craziest thing about this card, which is kind of laughable, it's for influence. What? What? It's for influence, which has to be a typo. Like, that has to be, like, just, like, a 2017 FFG, like, standard goof, right? Like, the, we, they need a certain amount of goofs per data pack. And I think that's what they did for this one. Because that's the same influence you have for cards that are, like, game-defining. Like, meta-defining. Like, that's biotic labor influence. That's, like, scorched earth influence. But no, we have a card that's comparable, if not strictly worse. Oh, no, well, yeah, like, very comparable to Wall Aesthetic. If you have any reason why this card should exist, let me know. Because I don't think this card should exist. This is a waste of cardboard. It, it just is. And it's a waste of a deck slot for Wayland. It's just... Oh man, it's so... Why are they doing this? This is the worst card we've seen in the whole cycle. And I'm even going to say that on top of cards that we've seen that are like... Horrible, but at least interesting. Like, what's it called? Something something construct. Which I still think... I don't understand how this works. But I think this might have been the worst card we've seen so far in the cycle. Because it's just laughably terrible but this might actually have some value at some point in the future i cannot imagine a reason why this card would either be better than spiderweb or wall static but don't worry we got actually two good wayland cards in this pack this is audacity it's an operation that costs zero uh, and it says play only if there are at least three cards in hq 
Trash all cards in HQ. Mm. Place a total of two advancement tokens on up to two cards that can be advanced. Four influence. You see, this is what a four influence card looks like. A card that lets you fast advance. So, Jemison has a very long subtitle. Uh, sacrifice, Audacity, Success. And we've seen Sacrifice. This is Audacity. We will see success by the time this cycle is over. Um, and yeah, so is this a Jemison card? It easily could be, but I think it can be anywhere. What does this card do? It lets you trash all your HQ and put two tokens for a single action. Why is that good? Because that means you can install a 3-2 agenda or a 3-1 agenda, advance it, and then play Audacity and score it. So you can start scoring your, your what's it called, uh, Atlas, Project Atlases. And that's really good. It's important to understand because this card says you can only play this if the three cards in HQ. Audacity counts towards the three cards in HQ. So in theory, you only have to trash two cards if that's all that's in HQ. Um, but trashing cards obviously is like an issue. That can be a problem. If you have agendas, you're going to be throwing them out. I think if there's any ID that might be able to get away with throwing out a bunch of agendas from HQ, it's Argus. Because Argus likes when there's multiple agendas in HQ, or sorry, in Archives, because it makes running Archives very dangerous. So maybe that's okay. But I still think um, this card is worth playing, as strong as an effect as this is. Um, or strong as a penalty that is, is. And that's for a couple reasons. I've been playing a lot of Titan Transnational. Titan Transnational, I think, is very, very good. Uh, I think it's competitively good. Um, and that's because of the existence of an agenda, which will only sadly exist for the next four months or so, which is called Atlas Tokens. Or Project Atlas, sorry. So Titan Transnational puts an agenda on an agenda counter on an agenda whenever you score it. So if you score it on a Project Atlas, it gets a counter on it, which means you can use that counter to find another card. So what I'll do is I'll fast advance out of Project Atlas. Normally I'm doing this with things like Trick of Light, stuff like that. So I fast advance this, and now I have an Atlas with a token on it. So anytime that I draw a Trick of Light or the next Project Atlas, I can now continue fast advancing. And there's a lot of games where you can win by turn 5, turn 6, by just fast advancing out all your agendas and largely only protecting central servers. It's very good, and it reminds me of the times where Astro Script was a 3 of index, and you could go super fast by just top decking the right things. I think it's very, very strong. Now, Audacity adds that toolkit. And sure, it might be uh, dangerous to fast advance out earlier in the game. Like, you might want to not do this turn 1 or turn 2 to trash your whole hand. Like, that's an issue, because now you have to draw cards, and running HQ is... Like, if you draw an agenda on your next turn, they can just run HQ and draw, hit that one agenda. So that's an issue. But this card represents a win condition, because as soon as you're on 5 points, and say you have an Atlas token, you can just pull the Atlas token to find your Audacity or find your Atlas, whatever you've not drawn, and win. You can just win. Um, also this card, mind you, is, uh, it's very hard to clot, because it puts two tokens for a single action. It's very, very difficult to clot. It's as difficult to clot as Trigger Light, so maybe some people are expecting it. But the idea with clot is generally people will play this when they know you're going to score. And now you can do install, advance, you can wait a bit, maybe think about what your third click is, maybe you're going to pretend to install another piece of ice, like, I don't know, can you gesture that? Can you, like, juke? Um, and then just play your, um, Audacity and win. It's a win condition. You might want to pull one of these in your deck. Just pull it with a Titan token, an Alice token, mind you, and close the game out. You can play two of these and play really aggressively to score your Alice's in the early game. I think it's very fantastic. I don't think you only have to do this in, in, in Titan. You can play this in any, basically, Wayland that's running Alice's or even three ones and just be able to score out your last agenda from hand. That's a very, very, very valuable um, uh, ability, and that can win games. I think that's very solid. You also put two advancements on two separate cards, so maybe this works in some sort of weird combo deck, but the balancing on this card is that you can only play one a turn, generally, unless you have some card that lets you draw in the middle. Um, also, if you play Audacity and then manage to top deck your, uh, what's it called, Election Day as the next card, and then you just draw five cards, you win. You definitely win. Also, if you protect Archives, like, maybe playing this isn't that bad, like playing Audacity, because next turn you can have preemptive action, and that's... Pretty solid, because it's hard to preemptive action agendas out of your hand, uh, because you have to leave them in archives anyways. It's very solid. It adds a win condition to a deck that I think is really strong. It adds a win condition to other Wayland decks as like a cheeky one of. It lets you play aggressive. It's all in all, it's good. And talking about like weird cheeky win conditions, we have Red Planet Couriers. This card has been spoiled for a while, and there's a lot of really interesting things people are doing with this. It's five to play, which is a lot. 
It's also a triple, which is an absurd amount of clicks. It takes your whole turn, right, to play this. And it says move all advancement tokens from all installed cards to one card that can be advanced. It's also four influence, which makes all these Wayland cards equally, just equally potent. I'm glad that you can't splash three of these easily in HP, because that would be absurd, right? Um, all right, so what do you do with this card? It's a triple. Which means it's very hard to play anything else besides just this. And what it does is you pay five credits and all the advancement tokens on all your ice and all your traps and everything just kind of like whoop. And they black hole to one center and hopefully uh, you maybe won the game. Or maybe you just built a really, really, really big firewall. I'm not sure. So the immediately like exciting thing to do with this is playing government takeover and fast advancing it. So this is Government Takeover. It's a one of in your deck. It is a six point agenda that takes nine advancement counters. So if you have nine advancement counters across all your ice, which isn't that difficult to deal with, do with things like ants and rows, dealing out those advancement counters slowly. Um, they don't actually have to be on ice with ants and they can come off ants in. Or you can also play things like uh, Dedication Ceremony. I've been playing Bill of the Bank, mind you, a deck that advances things a lot. Um, so once you have nine advancement counters, all you have to do is basically have all three of these in your hand with three of them being government takeover, your red planet couriers, and you need one extra click to be able to install something, so you need a biotic labor generally, just so you can play this for four credits, install your big old agenda, and then have three clicks left to, to send out the couriers. Um, you can win. You can win from one point. You suddenly fly up from one point to nine, uh, to seven, and that's obviously good how hard is this to do it's actually pretty hard um it legitimately is hard it's going to take you a while to get all those advancement out on ice and stuff your ice is vulnerable to ice destruction which puts you back in a meaningful way um like it is kind of janky in a lot of ways you have to draw a bunch of one ofs this is a lot better if you're playing titan uh and especially if you're playing alice tokens because now you only have to draw two of the cards and then you can use your titan token to find the last one and i think that's okay um, if you were to ask me, I don't think I'm really interested in this government takeover plan. Also, a lot of people are playing keyhole nowadays because it fights asset spam. Uh, and so if they keyhole your government takeover, you're going to be in a bad spot. Like this card's kind of in vogue right now, so be careful. How I would play this card is actually just as a win condition um, that also any deck that plays Biotic Labor, but just to score at a 5-3. Like, I don't think you have to go overboard on this thing. Like, I think if you just install a 5-3 Biotic Labor, play Red Planet Couriers, which you pull from your um, your deck with your Titan Atlas token, that's probably good enough. Like, I don't know if you have to go for the full 6, because getting 9 advancement tokens is pretty difficult. Getting 5 is much more manageable. And I don't think it's that hard to win from, to score 4 agenda points as it is... Like, it is much easier to score one, but I, I think this is probably good enough. You can go, all, like, full hog. If, go hog wild. Go for the full government takeover win thing. But um, I don't think it's necessary. This card's interesting. It also opens a, this this design, not design space, but this play space where you just advance naked a 5-3. And then next turn, you red planet couriers it and win. Perhaps they didn't expect you to win from an unadvanced card. You could also like install an Atlas token or an Atlas, sorry, a Project Atlas, and then Red Planet Couriers just to get like a bunch of advancement counters on it to over advance the thing so that it has a lot of tokens on it. Like you could do that. Um, maybe that's not too bad. I don't know where you get all the advancement tokens though. I think a lot of people might try playing because we built it, uh, which is generally not a great idea. Uh, as good as this gives you a credit a turn, advancing your ice manually is not very good. And I think you want to kind of lean on things like Dedication Ceremony and Ants and Rose because they're so much more efficient. And you can probably just play a better identity. But this is a win condition. This easily can be a one of in an Atlas deck or a Titan deck that runs a single Biotic Labor or multiple Biotic Labors. And you can probably win out of nowhere. I've also seen people try and combo this off with things like Hasty Relocation, Accelerated Diagnostics, and that might also be possible, but that's a lot of cards you need to draw, and I don't know what your other win condition is while you flood up in HQ, so do be careful. It's a wild card. It's a really, really wild card, and we only have one left. This is Owl. Um, oh, actually, very worth pointing out, I don't know if this is a goof, but Matt Zellinger has been drawing art on a lot of Netrunner cards for a long time, and this is the first card I think he's referred to Matthew. I don't know whether that's meaningful or not this is owl it's a league art we all love league art so owl is a sentry it's two credits uh it's one strength and has a single subroutine that says add one installed program to the top of the stack its eyes keep following you and it's no influence it's like a pure neutral card this card's really interesting um it's not a very intimidating piece of ice in the late game or the mid game. It generally only costs one credit to break, but you only spend two credits resing it, so that's not too bad. And it has an effect that we've seen very rarely before, which is add and program to the top of the stack. 
Now, sentries generally attack programs, and a lot of times you see trash a program. And this is definitely different, and I don't think it is 100% worse. I think in some ways it actually might be better. So trashing programs for the last while hasn't been that good. And the reason why it hasn't been that good is because Anarchs got this, uh, this suite of programs that can come back from the heap over and over again. Sure, if you play Scorpius, it's different. But the idea is if you have an owl, and you have it in front of whatever your end of the run du jour is, let's just say we're playing vanilla because we're playing a rush deck, and you have an owl in front of the vanilla, or say you have like a rototur, say you have something that trashes a program in front of vanilla, you trash their paperclip, they continue. I guess rototur is a bad example. Just a snake, a cobra, something that trashes a program and doesn't end the run. So you get through that, and now you hit the vanilla, but you don't have a refractor, but you can install paperclip from the bin. So it only comes down to a financial tax, but it won't keep a runner out of a server, which is what you're trying to do if you're trying to rush out the runner to a quick win. Owl fights that. Owl takes your program and does two cool things with it. It puts it on top of your stack, so obviously it's not installed, so you can no longer break the thing behind your owl, but it also gums up your draw and makes you reinstall your program, which I guess you're going to do anyways if they trash the program, like you're going to have to spend that money, but it actually gums up your draw. Like you know what your next draw is, and it's good because you probably want to draw and install your program again, but it actually slows down the runner in a considerable way, um, and which is kind of one of the things that a rush deck wants to do, and I think that's the kind of corp that's going to be playing this. Um, there's actually, this has been a, uh, like a pretty risky, and for a while it wasn't a very good thing to do, but this is an archetype you can do. Uh, a lot of times this is called super modernism, that people will play like an ID like this. An ID that is pretty good in the early game, but gets worse and worse as time goes on. And then with this money and running cheap ice, you can rush out to seven points pretty fast, while always threatening some sort of kill threat on top of that by playing things like uh mid-seasons replacements or hard-hitting news or sea source or stuff like that ways to tag the runner and then maybe kill them now these sort of uh these sort of um archetypes want to go fast and because they're going fast they don't have a lot of time to click for credits and gain money or play operations that give money so they generally run a lot of cheap ice because the idea is like who cares if the game's not going to go to like uh, this is magnet right a magnet no magnet's not the one i wanted i wanted a uh, quandary which i never understand this spell it's quandary right um, so Quandary is a cheap res, and late game it's going to be broken for only one credit, so you, the point is don't get to late game. Res your Quandary for one on your remote server, and now the runner has to go and find their uh, decoder, they have to install their decoder, and now they have to run again, which might be just all the time you need to score up to maybe five or maybe seven points. Now, we had a bunch of ice like this, we have Quandary, we have Vanilla we've seen before, but we've never had a sentry that technically is like an early game, uh, this is going to stop aggression. And this is the first one that we've seen like this. Um, we have seen other two cost sentries that end the run, but they generally need some sort of extra support. Things like Newshound needs currents, um, things like uh, Tour Guide need res things and remotes, but this is the first one that you actually can put in a rush deck and pay two credits for it and hope that it will keep the runner out as long as it's placed positionally well. Um, the closest thing we've had to that is Cobra, which is twice as expensive. Uh, this does trash programs, which again isn't that great against these like recurring breakers or clone chip or stuff like that, but doing two net damage is actually pretty sweet. But this is Owl, and I think Owl is very comparable. Uh, in the late game also, like if you are not playing a rush deck, I don't know if you play this ice just because you're not getting a lot of value for the card slot. If you're not trying to go fast and forcing the runner to go through this before they are prepared to deal with it. Because the runner is dealing with this and they're bringing this with their Mimics or Mongoose. It's only one credit. You do get a bit of bonus value if the runner is playing MK Ultra, because then I think they break it for like two or three credits, which is pretty funny. I think this is three credits. Yeah, so if they break it for three credits, you win. It also is low strength, so it could be parasited. But all in all, I think it's actually pretty reasonable i think this is cool it's probably best in decks where runners don't expect early sentries because again if they do put their sentry breaker at your owl looks kind of dumb so i think that's mostly nbn and wayland i don't think those are corps that generally people respect sentries in the early game while things like architect are respecting the hb early game and things like um basically all sentries in jinteki respected early game so i don't think it's that good in those but it's super good in um in uh other uh other uh those other two factions um yeah it's it's fine it's solid it's it's a really cool piece to to rush out and slow down draw and make sure people don't get in servers and it does exactly what it says on the tin um that's owl hey owl how's it going that's it that's the entire data pack um wow a lot of really good stuff in there 
like a lot of really, really, really strong stuff, like the sort of meta defining stuff that we've seen uh, in Flashpoint cycle more than we have in the Red Sand cycle. I think Barrow to War Clue, Crew is a big deal. I'm super excited about playing Ag Infusion. Uh, I think. Uh, no, uh, I think Audacity is probably worth a slot. Owl's worth a slot. We saw a lot of the runner stuff that's really good, but all in all, very interesting stuff. We did see a couple of duds, I think. Like, I don't think, well, like, obviously, Battlement's not fantastic, and I don't think Next Opal is nigh as near unplayable based off of the wording. But all in all, very good pack. A lot of good flavor, a lot of really good stuff. I'm excited to play Netrunner for the next couple of weeks. Again, let me know anything that I missed. There's definitely a lot that I do miss on these things. So let me know what you're excited to play. Well, let me know what sort of interactions are you think are very interesting. And, uh, Hopefully we'll be seeing you. We're live streaming Thursday nights and we got videos coming out. Hopefully next week we'll have more videos than this week. It's been a pretty difficult week. Um, we'll be trying all these new things on Jintechie.net. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. Stay tuned. We got more videos coming out most nights. <laughs> thanks for watching.